Good morning, everyone. The topic for today's presentation is smile designing and the aesthetic principles in FPD. It will be covered in two, uh, two parts. These are the contents of part one, and these are the contents of the part two. Coming to introduction, a smile can convey a thousand different meanings. An attractive and pleasing smile enhances the acceptance of the individual in the society. Also, it influences the attractiveness and personality of the individual. Coming to the definitions, aesthetic dentistry is the art and science of dentistry that is applied to create or enhance beauty of an individual within functional and physiologic limits. Whereas smile designing is a process wherein the complete oral health and soft tissues are studied and evaluated and the changes are brought about which will have a positive influence on the overall aesthetics of the face. Coming on to the classification, according to Anthony, uh, Gary Miller and Josephine, the smiles are classified into three uh, broad uh, types, that is high smile line, medium smile line and low smile line. In the, the high smile line reveals in the total cervical incisal length of the tooth. In addition to it, it also reveals a bend of a gingiva, whereas an average smile line reveals 75 to 100% of the uh, cervical incisal length of the maxillary tooth. Uh, in addition, it also reveals in the interproximal papilla. Whereas the low smile line displays only 75% of the length of the anterior teeth. Whereas depending on the exposure of the labial mucous membrane, it can be broadly classified as papillary smile, gingival smile, and mucosal smile. The papillary smile exposes only the interdental papilla, whereas gingival smile exposes also a band of attached gingiva, whereas mucosal smile exposes the alveolar mucosa. Coming on to the curvature of the lip plane, uh, based on the curvature of the lip plane, it can be classified as convex smile, straight smile, and concave smile. Whereas coming on to the various styles, it can be broadly classified as commissor smile, cuspid smile, and complex smile. Now, firstly, coming to the commissor smile that is seen in 67% of the individuals. Now, the characteristic of this smile is this: is that firstly the corner of the mouth are contracted upward and outward, and then the elevator muscles of the lip contract, exposing the uh, ex exposing the anterior tip. Now, in the commissor smile, the maxillary molar it is around two to three mm above to that of the incisal edge of the central incisors. That is the characteristic of commissar smile. Whereas in the cuspid smile, the, the most uh, important feature is uh, most active is the levator muscles of the upper lip. Here, the levator levi superioris contracts first, exposing the canine, and then the corner of the mouth move in an upward and outward direction. Now in the cuspid smile, the corner of the mouth are at a level inferior to that of the uh, level of the upper lip. This is known as a gulping effect, which is seen in a cuspid smile. Whereas in the complex smile, the levator muscles of the upper lip, corner of the mouth, and depression muscles of the lower lip all contract all together, uh, revealing the uh, maxillary as well as the mandibular teeth. Coming to the type, uh, types of smile, based on the amount of display, it can be broadly classified as type 1 to type 5, where type 1 uh, exposes only the maxillary teeth, whereas type 2 exposes the maxillary teeth and uh, 3 mm of the gingival tissue, whereas type 3 exposes only the mandibular teeth, whereas type 4 exposes the maxillary as well as the mandibular teeth, and type 5 uh, exposes neither the maxillary nor the mandibular teeth. Coming on to the physical, uh, physical uh, attributes of the dentofacial composition, they are contrast, unity, uh, which includes the cohesive and the segregative forces, the symmetry, proportion, dominance, visual tension, balance, and gradation. We'll see each one in detail. Now, coming on to the contrast. Contrast is a factor which makes uh, various elements of a composition visible. Uh, now, contrast can, can be in the terms of colors, lines, or patterns, or textures. Also, contrast helps in providing illusion. Now, the vertical lines that are present on the tooth, it will accentuate, accentuate the length, whereas the horizontal lines will give an illusion of the increased width. Whereas, coming to unity, unity gives different parts of the composition the effect of a whole. The unity between different parts of the face and teeth is essential to give the uh, comp entire composition the effect of a oneness. Now, unity can be broadly classified, uh, can be broadly uh, divided into the cohesive and the segregative forces. The cohesive forces unify the composition, whereas segregative forces breaks the monotony of the composition. Now, in a natural smile, it is a combination of both the cohesive and a segregative forces. So while designing smile, we should include both the cohesive and the segregative effect to give smile a more dynamic kind of an appearance. 
where is coming to visual tension it is a tension that is brought about by the presence of certain elements that cause imbalance in the composition now for an example if a, if a circle is present at one end of the corner of a page it will create visual tension now moving the circle to the center or adding another circle at the end of the page will will create a level of balance now a dental example for this is when a uh, lateral incisor is distally inclined on one side now it will create visual tension now to compensate that we can make a more mesial inclination of the first premolar on the another side coming on to symmetry symmetry is the regularity in arrangement of the objects symmetry can be either horizontal or radiating symmetry now in the horizontal symmetry the, the objects uh, that are there they, they are the mirror image of each other However, the horizontal symmetry is very monotonous. Coming to the radiating symmetry, here the two objects are similar, but they are not completely mirror image of each other, which gives smile a more. So while we are designing a smile, we should have a horizontal symmetry closer to the mid midline. That is why designing the shape of the central incisors and the gingival level of the central incisors, we can have a horizontal symmetry. Whereas there should be radiating symmetry as we move away from the midline. That is by uh, designing the uh, proportions of the lateral and the canine, uh, the relative proportions of the lateral and canine in comparison to the central incisors to give smile a more dynamic appearance. Coming to proportion, proportion is to give a certain mathematical representation of beauty. Now the various proportions uh, that are uh, in, uh, that are, are a golden proportion, pristine proportion, recurrent aesthetic dental proportion, and facial proportions that that can be either vertical and horizontal. Now we'll see in each one in detail in the later slides. Coming on to dominance, dominance directs the attention to the more attractive features of the patient's face. It is governed by three factors: that is shape of the teeth size and color now the shape of the teeth gives a uh, uh, appearance of uh, bold and the characteristic appearance whereas size of the central incisor and canines can be uh, increased to give a dominant appearance also color plays a vital role now as seen in the picture uh, the two maxillary incisors are exceeding in length as compared to that of the central and the canine which give them a feature of an individual dominance coming to illusions now, illusion works on two basic principles, that is, principle of illumination and principle of line. Now, principle of illumination states that shadow creates depth, whereas light creates prominences. And a multidirectional light adds a third dimension of depth. Whereas, coming on to the principle of line, the horizontal line uh, gives an illusion of a wider depth, whereas vertical line gives an illusion of a longer depth. Now the shaping and contouring of illusion, it involves four important factors. That is shaping of the teeth, staining, arrangement of the teeth, and modifying the form and color of the tooth. Now in the cases when the tooth are too short, uh, now when the tooth are too sh short, several techniques can be used to create the illusion of length. Firstly, the uh, gingival third should be narrowed, measured distally, so that uh, even if the tooth is uh, short, it appears to be uh, tapered and elongated. Now, as, as seen in the picture, the gingival third is narrowed down, measured distally. Now, this effect can further be enhanced by making the middle third of the labial surface more flat. It gives an illusion of increased length due to increased in the vertical reflecting surface. Also, the shape of the incisal edge, it can be altered by gently sloping the mesoincisal and the distroincisal line angle uh, gingivally from the center. Also, vertical lines present on the tooth can uh, give an illusion of increased length. Now, in the cases when uh, the tooth is too long, now this happens when there is alveolar or the gingival recession. Uh, in these cases, the length of the pontic or the crown should be made to appear shorter. Now for doing so, we uh, increase the vertical contact area. Now the uh, vertical contact area value was A. We increase it to B to give a, a long tooth appearance of a decreased length. Also, uh, the incisal third and the cervical third can be given a lingual inclination. And we can also decrease the length by notching the center of the incisal edge. Now in cases when the length of the pontic or the crown is too long and it is not possible to create an illusion of a short, shorter tooth, then the gingival tone cera ceramics can be used in the uh, uh, cervical third area to mask the length. 
Now, uh, in the cases when the space available is wider than the ideal tooth replacement. Now, uh, when the space available is wider, it can happen when the space was already present prior to the extraction of tooth or in cases of long-standing edentulousness where the space is increased because of the drifting. So in these cases, to decrease the width of the replaced tooth, we can, uh, we can move the contact area more uh, lingually and cervically. Now in this picture, the tooth A is bigger than that of the tooth B, but it uh, appears to be in smaller direction by moving the contact area more uh, cerv cervically and lingually. Also, the mesoincisal and the distoincisal line angles uh, can be rounded off to create an illusion of decreased width. I mean, cases of a canine, the visual center, that is the uh, facial ridge, it can be moved more mesially. Uh, to create to uh, create an illusion of decreased width, also the tip of the canine, if possible, can be moved more easily. Now, when the space available is narrow, then the ideal tooth replacement. Now, in this case, is the contact area can be moved more labially and incisally, whereas and also the incisal edge can be made as flat and as horizontal as possible. Now, in the cases when the maxillary central incisors are involved. We can rotate the distal aspects more labially. Now, this will give a uh, uh, bold and characteristic uh, appearance. Whereas, uh, in case of a lateral incisor, uh, in, uh, when the patient is a female, the mesial aspect of the lateral incisor can be rotated and laped buckly to give a soft feminine appearance. Whereas, in case of a male, it can be rotated and left lingually to, to give a, a appearance of width and boldness. Now, coming on to the components of the dentofacial complex, they can be broadly divided into facial components, dental components, gingival components, and physical components. Coming on to the facial components, there are four references, that is horizontal references, vertical references, sagittal references, and phonetic references. Coming on to the horizontal references, the horizontal references are three, that is the interpupillary line, the commercial line, and the ophriac line. The interpupillary line it runs from the center of the pupils of the eye, whereas commissural line runs from the corners of the mouth, whereas ophriac line uh, runs from the upper border of the eyebrows. Now, uh, the, the incisal and the uh, incisal level of the teeth, also the gingival level, it should be parallel to the interpupillary line. Now, this helps in analyzing any asymmetric present. Now, in this case, the gingival levels they are parallel to the interpupillary line. Whereas in this case, the gingival levels are not parallel to the interpupillary line, which shows canting of the maxilla. Now, uh, a minimal degree of canting, some degree is can be corrected by the gingival contouring. However, if the canting is more, it requires surgical correction. That is coming on to the vertical references. For the, the vertical references are two. That is the facial midline and the dental midline. The facial midline passes through the center of the glabella, tip of the nose, filtrum, and the tip of the chin. And now studies say that the facial midline coincides with the dental midline only in 75% in 70 of the individuals. Coming on to the sagittal references, the sagittal references includes the uh, upper and the lower lip support, the aesthetic line, and the occlusal plane. Now, the contour of the upper and the lower lip uh, help in determining the position of the anterior tip. Whereas, aesthetic line, it is an imaginary line connecting the tip of the nose to the most prominent part of the chin. Now, in an ideal case scenario, the maxillary lip is 4 mm behind the aesthetic line, whereas the mandibular lip is 2 mm behind the aesthetic line. Also, the occlusal plane should be analyzed. It should be parallel to the interpupillary line. Coming on to the phonetic references. The phonetic references, we have F and B sounds, M sound, and the S and the Z sounds. Now, when pronouncing sounds like F and V, the incisal edge of the uh, upper anterior teeth touches the vermilion border of the lower limb. Whereas, when sounds like M are pronounced, uh, the patient is asked to sit in an upright position and pronounce sounds uh, starting from M. In that, uh, the, uh, the lips are in a rest position, which helps to evaluate the position of the incisal edge at rest. Whereas, when sounds like Ch or Ch are pronounced, it helps in evaluating the Siloman's closest speaking space. Coming on to the facial proportions, uh, horizontally the face is divided into three equal thirds and vertically into five equal halves. 
uh, horizontally it is divided into three parts from the lines uh, beginning from the uh, upper hairline supra orbital ridge tip of the nose and tip of the chin this four lines divided into three equal halves whereas vertically there is middle fifth there is central fifth middle fifth and the lateral fifth the central fifth that starts uh, is from the canthus of one eye to the canthus of other eye whereas middle fifth involves the width of the eye whereas the lateral fifth is from the outer border border of the eye to the outer border of the ear now in cases of an ideal face the central fifth is equal to that of the middle fifth that is intercanthal distance is equal to the width of the eye also the interpupillary distance is equal to the uh, distance of the corner of the mouth now uh, the tooth visibility is it is a term for the amount of uh, tooth structure or gingival uh, display that is shown in various lip positions the average maxillary incisal display rest when the lips are at rest is 1.91 mm in male uh, and uh, 3.4 mm in female coming on to the dentofacial composition the constituents of this element are the oral orifice the lips and the teeth it involves uh, two positions that is the static muscular position and the dynamic muscular position in the static muscular position four factors are involved that is the lip length age race and sex whereas in the dynamic muscular position it is influenced by the contraction of the facial muscles shape and thickness of the teeth and the skeletal makeup of the individual now what is the uh, lars factor that is the lip length age race and sex uh, the lip length uh, it also helps in determining the position of the incisal edge coming on to the age uh, the age or the age helps also determines the amount of the display now in an aged individual the display of the lower teeth is more whereas in case of a race uh, it studies have demonstrated that the black people show less amount of teeth as compared to that of the caucasians whereas females demonstrate uh, of, uh, to uh, two third more teeth as compared to that of the males coming on to the lip and the lip lines the length and curvature and shape of the lip it also influences the amount of the tooth exposure the patients with short upper lips and younger patients display generally more maxillary tooth structure coming on to the lip line they are broadly classified into three groups that is low lip line medium lip line and high lip line the low lip line covers the gingiva and a considerable portion of anterior teeth now in cases of a low lip line there is usually no incisal display when the lips are at rest Uh, when the patient smells completely there might be 3 to 4 mm of display in cases of a low lip line whereas in cases of a medium lip line at rest uh, there is display of 1 to 3 mm of the incisal edges whereas in full smile the uh, total uh, length of the teeth in addition to interdental papilla is also visible whereas in case of a high lip line the entire cervical incisal length in addition 4 to 5 mm of the gingiva is also exposed now coming on to the coming on to the various treatments in cases of low lip line to modify uh, low lip line the visibility of the teeth can be enhanced by modifying the smile uh, for that it might be necessary it might be necessary to lengthen the crowns of uh, if the crown root ratio and the occlusion permit now the median lip line is the most preferred the treatment for the high lip line is limited if any uh, gingival asymmetry is present it should be carefully evaluated uh, and uh, should be treated prior to any aesthetic treatment planning coming on to the smile line it is an imaginary line passing through the incisal edges of the upper anterior teeth it is broadly divided into convex smile line straight smile line and concave smile line coming on to the dental components the dental components are dental midline two dimensions symmetry axial inclination incisal edge position interdental contact area and the interdental embrasures coming on to the dental midline the verticality of the dental midline it is more critical than the mediolateral position the uh, dental midline it should be kept perpendicular to the pupillary or the horizontal or the horizontal reference lines now as i stated the studies have demonstrated that the dental midline coincides with the facial midline only in 70% of the individuals also the maxillary and the mandibular midline do not coincide in 75% of the individuals therefore the lower the mandibular midline should not be used as a reference for uh, establishing the maxillary midline
Now, minor discrepancy uh, is allowed in between the facial midline and the dental midline. A maximum allowed discrepancy is around 2 mm. Uh, as long uh, now this discrepancy is allowed as long as the uh, midline is perpendicular to the interfibrillary line and the various reference points for assessing the midline are the glabella tip of the nose tip of the chin whereas the filtrum of the lip is the most accurate whereas coming now coming to various proportion theories the the various two, two tooth width proportion theories includes the golden proportions, Christian proportion, recurrent aesthetic proportion, and the various special proportions. Coming on to the golden proportion, it was first mentioned by Lombard and it was developed by Levin. It is the uh, it, it is this proportion uh, so it is in the simplest form between any larger and the smaller part. Coming uh, when applied to dentistry, uh, it states that the central incisor are 62% wider than the lateral, which in turn are 62% wider than the canine. So the golden proportion is 1.6 is to 1 is 2.6. Now. And now it was it is seen that by applying the golden proportion in each case it can result in an unesthetic looking smile therefore the golden proportion was modified uh, uh, to apply it individually for each patient now in it the width of the patient central incisor and the total intermolar distance are taken into consideration for calculating the golden proportion now more is the intermolar distance lesser is the golden proportion Coming on to the Preston proportion, now Preston found out that only 17% of the lateral incisor and no canine was in the golden proportion. So he gave Preston's proportion, that is the size of the lateral incisor. It is 66% the width of the central size and size of the canine is 55% the width of the central incisor. Whereas coming on to the recurrent aesthetic dental proportion, it was proposed by Ward in 2000. The recurrent aesthetic dental proportion, it incorporates the existing or the desired length of the uh, maxillary central incisors. Also, it considers the intercanine width to calculate the sizes of the maxillary teeth. Now, the, the recurrent... Uh, the recurrent aesthetic dental proportion now it states that uh, a uniform width to length ratio should be maintained when we move from the central incisor to the canine uh, it is stated that 75 to uh, 78 percent of the width length ratio is more preferred the recurrent aesthetic dental proportion it varies according to the size of the tip for uh, it varies from 62 to 80 percent for the very tall tip uh, it can be kept at 62 percent for the tall tip it can be kept at uh, 66 percent for the normal tip it can be kept at 70 percent for very sh for short teeth it is kept at 75 percent and for very short teeth it is at 80 percent the recurrent aesthetic proportion for the tall size teeth uh, for the very tall size uh, maxillary teeth is equal to the golden proportion that is 62 percent now the example for the recurrent aesthetic proportion and now this picture shows the normal length teeth representing uh, uh, the 70 percent recurrent aesthetic proportion this picture shows a short teeth very short teeth demonstrating 80 percent recurrent aesthetic proportion whereas this picture shows the golden proportion that is 62 percent recurrent aesthetic proportion for the very tall teeth Coming on to the proportion determined by the facial form. Now, Hall proposed that uh, the typical form concept in which he classified the teeth into either ovoid, tapering, and the square form. Whereas, various biometric uh, ratio stated that the width of the central incisor, it is 1 by 16, the bizygomatic width. He also stated that the outline of the maxillary incisor, it uh, closely resembles the outline of the face. However, this theory was challenged by Russian Fisher, which uh, introduced the dentogenic concept. The dentogenic concept is governed by the SPF factor, that is the sex, personality, and age of an individual. Now, coming on to the first, uh, first sex, in female, the incisor edges are kept more uh, rounded and the uh, inclination is, uh, is comparatively less, whereas in males, the incisor edges less rounded coming on to the coming on to the age the in the young teeth uh, the incisal edges are not worn and also the incisal embrasures are very well defined whereas the aged individuals uh, there is wear of the incisal embrasures also the amount of the to display is less 
there is coming on to the personality uh, in cases of an kanai for a person with a vigorous personality it can be kept more pointed uh, and the custodian can be kept more sharp whereas in case of a person with a soft personality the custodian can be kept a bit rounded and short Coming on to the proportion determined by the dentist and the patient preference, uh, Brisbane evaluated that mostly the patients and the dentist preferred uh, the width to length ratio of uh, 0.75 to 0.8 and the 70% recurrent aesthetic proportion. Now a study, a study was done to evaluate the present, presence of golden ratio in the maxillary anterior teeth and its significance in the aesthetic smiles. Now the results of the study stated that the ratio of the width of the central incisor to the width of the lateral incisor when viewed of, uh, from the front uh, was matching only uh, in five subjects, whereas the ratio of the cervical incisal height of the central incisor and combined with central and lateral incisor was matching in only one subject with a golden proportion. Therefore, to conclude, the golden proportion was found to exist, exist only in a small percentage of individuals with an aesthetic smile. In the standardization of aesthetics by the ratios and proportions um, might not be helpful in every, uh, it should not be idealized in every case scenario and should be calculated accordingly. Now, another study uh, evaluated the golden proportion, recurrent aesthetic dental proportion, and crystal uh, pro proportion, the prevalence among the local population. The results stated that the golden proportion ex existed for 1.1% 1. Uh, of the participants, whereas recurrent aesthetic proportion exhibited for 5.3% of the participants, and the crystal proportion was seen for 2.4% of the participants on, on the left side and 5.3% for the right side. When combined, the crystal proportion did not exist for any of the participants. Uh, when combined together. Therefore, the prevalence of the recurrent aesthetic dental proportion was uh, when evaluated more, was more uh, as followed by the golden proportion, whereas the pristine proportion was not seen in the participants with aesthetically pleasing smile. Now coming on to the symmetry. Um, the rules of the symmetry are that the dental midline should be kept straight also the smile line should follow the convexity of the lower limb. The central incisors, that is the, uh, the horizontal symmetry should be maintained uh, in the size of the central incisor and also in the gingival margin. Also, the gingival embrasure, the incisal embrasures gradually deepen from the central incisors to the canine. And the mesial inclinations are more pleasing as compared to that of the distal inclinations. Coming on to the axillary axil axil inclination, in an aesthetic smile, the direction of the anterior teeth and the long axis show a gradual progression. Now we've seen there is a gradual increase in the axial inclination as you move from the central incisor to the canine. Now the deviation beyond a certain degree is uh, can cause an unattractive smile. Coming on to the incisal edge position, the maxillary incisal edge position is the most important determinant uh, in, est in uh, establishing a smile as it serves as a reference point to determine the tooth proportion and also the relate uh, the relative proportions of the adjacent tip. Now the parameters used to evaluate the incisal edge position are first the degree of the tooth display, phonetics and the patient input. Now coming on to first the degree, degree of tooth, uh, tooth display. It states that uh, when the when the lips are relaxed and the mouth is slightly open, around 3 to 3.5 mm of the incisal third of the maxillary incisors should be visible. Whereas coming on to phonetics, now uh, when the patient is asked is uh, seated in an upright position and is asked to repeatedly pronounce words starting from M, the uh, the lips gently close. For, well, after the pronunciation of the words, the lips are in a rest position, which helps us to evaluate the position of the incisal edge at rest. Also, the patient desires should be kept in consideration uh, the, the aesthetic demands of the patient while establishing the incisal edge. Whereas, coming on to the interdental contact area and uh, contact point, the interproximal contact area, it is defined as a broad zone in which two adjacent teeth touch. It follows 50 is to 40 is to 30 rule when we move from the central incisor towards the canine. Now, a gradual increase in the uh, interproximal contact area gives an inclusion or uh, illusion of increased length over width. Also, the interproximal contact point, it is the most incisal aspect of the uh, interproximal contact area. 
Now coming on to our case scenario, here the, the vertical uh, length of the teeth was lost, also the uh, inter, uh, interproximal contact area and the incisal embrasures. They are not well defined uh, and uh, leading to the loss of the characteristic appearance of the teeth. In it, the incisal embrasures uh, and the contact point are carried down further cervically, making the incisal third uh, narrower and creating an illusion of longer teeth. Also, the aesthetic recontouring of the incisal edges is done. Coming on to the incisal, incisal embrasures, the incisal embrasures should display a gentle progressive increase in depth uh, when we move from the central incisor to the canine. Uh, and, and this uh, incisal embrasures should mimic the smile line. Now, if the proper, proper contouring or the depth of the incisal embrasures is not given, then uh, the dentition will have will have a block-like appearance. It will the teeth will not have any individual characteristic. So, the incisal embrasures should be carefully uh, given. This uh, the following contents will be covered in the part two. Thank you. Thank you, Ritvi. It was a wonderful presentation. And uh, hope in second part we will going to cover the maximum case scenarios as well.